Good morning. Welcome to the first session of day two of Virtual Fox Fest. This is the how and why of recursion. I'm Tamar Grainer. And today, well, who am I first? I've been writing and speaking about Fox Pro and Visual Fox Pro since the late 1980s. Uh, been the author or co-author of a whole bunch of books. Um, I am co-organizer of this conference and of Southwest Fox. And um, I work with both with lots of different companies. I do a lot of work involving working with existing applications and helping move them forward or keep them running. And I often work with other developers always interested in hearing about new opportunities. So in this session, we're gonna talk about recursion. I'll introduce it, talk about what I mean when I say recursion, and then we'll look at lots and lots of examples where I have used recursion in tools and in production applications. And then at the end, we'll talk about some of the ways you can get recursion wrong. And at this point, I'm gonna hide me so you can see more of what I'm showing. So what is, what about recursion, introducing it? Recursion is a really powerful tool that gives you some easy ways to get things done. But my experience is a lot of people are afraid of it. They've been told, oh, recursion is dangerous. Don't use recursion. I find that in my world, the, the warnings about recursion are a lot like the warnings about using the passive voice in English. People say you should never do that. And my answer is, it's there, so why shouldn't I use it? Let's just learn how. So what do I mean when I say recursion? I mean a routine that calls itself or a set of routines that call each other over and over so that you come back and run the same routine again. It comes from the verb to recur, to happen again. And in fact, in my view, the word for what it does is recur, but you'll hear a lot of people say recurse. You won't hear me say that again. Recursion isn't hard, but you do have to set things up correctly. On the slide, you see an example of something you may be familiar with, the factorials. N factorial is the product of the numbers from one to N. And while you can say it that way, you can also define N factorial as N times n minus one factorial, and that's a recursive definition. So on the slide, what I've shown you is working down through four factorial is four times three factorial, and which is four times three times two factorial and so on. By definition, zero factorial is one. So when you, if you want to compute four factorial recursively, what you end up with is right at the bottom of the slide here, after you go all the way down is four times three times two times one times one. And this is true, this isn't just programming, this is a math thing. But we will look at code for this. When you wanna write a recursive routine, there are a few key elements for that routine. The first is there has to be an exit case. There must be a way that eventually you stop calling the same thing over and over and get out. For factorials, I told you what that is. Zero factorial is defined as one. You must have something change in the various calls so that eventually you get to the exit case. In factorials, we will reduce the value by one on each call so that eventually we get to the exit case of zero factorial. Those first two items apply whether we're talking about algorithms in math or computer science or actual code. The third bullet on this slide, local variables, is an implementation issue. You need to make sure when you actually write code for recursion that you declare variables so that one call doesn't step on another. And this is a particular implementation issue in VFP because of the different variable scopes and what happens when you don't declare a variable. We'll talk about that much later in the session, how you can get this wrong. For now, let's just go take a look at a recursive version of the factorial routine. And I called it factorial recursive. 
It receives a single input as parameter and has a variable for a result. And then we just have a case statement. If the input is greater than zero, we say the result is gonna be the input times factorial recursive, this routine passing one less than the input we passed this time. So this is the get change something so that we eventually get to the exit case. Here's the exit case. If the input is zero, set end result to one. We also have a validity checking case here. If the input is less than zero, we're gonna return minus one and that's a, just an error value to tell us that, oops, you shouldn't have called this routine with a negative value. And in the end, we return the result. So I wrote a little bit of a little routine to let us run this. And the routine is gonna prompt for a value. And then I'm gonna call factorial recursive with that value and then use a message box to show the result. Just something sim just some simple demo where. So here's the example that was on the slide. If I put four, four factorial is 24. Four times three times two times one is 24. And if I run it again with something larger, if I go for 20, 20 factorial is some big number that I'm not gonna try to read. That gets big fast. Okay, so that's a very simple example. And we can see that recursion works in VFP. But let's talk for a bit now about when we shouldn't use recursion. What I elided in that example by only using 20 for the second value is that of course, factorial is gonna put a lot of calls on the stack. And the default stack size in VFP is 128. You can make 128 calls by default without breaking anything. You can set the stack size variable in your config.fpw file, and that can go up to 64,000. So theoretically, we could use this factorial routine to compute up to 64,000 factorial, except I'm pretty sure that we would run out, that, that that number would be way too big and VFP couldn't handle it. You also can um, test to see, am I approaching the stack size? Do I need to stop what I'm doing? Program of minus one tells you how many things are on the stack right now. So you could in certain situations write code that tests and um, gracefully handles recursion too deep for the stack. But of course, if your recursive routine is gonna get you into stack size trouble, then maybe you shouldn't do it recursively. And one of the rules of thumb is if you can write something recursively, there is always a way to write it iteratively as well. Sometimes the iterative code will be very simple. And in fact, in the materials for this session, there's an iterative version of the factorial routine. And it's actually just as simple, maybe simpler. Sometimes writing iterative code is a lot harder requires a lot of work. And those are the cases where you wanna be sure to go ahead and use recursion if you can make it work. Another, oops, another example of when we shouldn't use recursion is when it's gonna to do too much work. I tested speed for the factorial routine. When I pass in five as a parameter, the iterative version is about two and a half times faster. When I pass a number up near 500 as the parameter, the iterative routine is about eight times faster. So that isn't growing exponentially, but it is growing. There's overhead in doing it recursively. Some routines are get big really fast when you do them recursively. The Fibonacci series that you have pro you probably know it. It begins with two ones, and then each next value is the sum of the two that came before it. And that's the formula I've written on the slide. So it's one, one, two, three, five, eight, 13, 21, 34, 55, et cetera. And we can certainly, you can see from the slide that it's pretty easy to write a recursive routine to do that. And in fact, I've done so. receives a single parameter, 
big case statement. This looks a lot like the factorial routine and unlike pretty much all the other code in this session. If the input value is greater than two, then the result is call this routine fib or occur with one less and call it with two less. If the input is one or two, return one. If the input is something else, return minus one, that's a sign of an error. And we can, again, I wrote a little routine to run this. It's just like the previous one, except for Fibonacci. So if I ask for the sixth Fibonacci number, it's eight. If I ask for the 20th Fibonacci number, it's 67, 65. These don't get big as fast. But what happens if I ask for the 30th Fibonacci number? Watch how long this takes. That was a lot slower. Why is that? Well, this chart on the slide is how many calls we make to fib recur when we pass different input values. So for the sixth value, it was 15 calls, not a big deal. For the 20th, it was 13,529 calls. And I don't even have the one for the 30th. So what's going on here? Well, every time you pass a number greater than two, you are calling the Fibonacci routine twice, but each of those is calling it twice and so forth all the way down the line. In fact, if you look at this chart, you'll notice that for each value, the number of calls is the sum of the number of calls of the previous two plus one. So nine calls for the fifth value, which is three plus five plus one and so on. So this gets big really fast. It gets big, it, it, it pretty much grows like the Fibonacci numbers. And so it would never be a good idea to use the, to use a recursive routine for the Fibonacci numbers. Although the iterative version, which is included in the materials for this session, the code is not as clean. It's, you have to think a little bit harder about how it works. All right, at this point, before we go into some examples that I've actually used, um, are there any questions? Um, no, it doesn't appear that there are. Okay, right. There probably will be later. I'll go on. Okay, so one of the places that recursion is particularly useful is when dealing with any kind of a hierarchy because it just is a really natural process for traversing through a hierarchy, for going down the hierarchy until you've dealt with everything. When you use recursion for hierarchies, you rarely run into stack size issues because you're rarely dealing with hierarchies that have hundreds or thousands of levels. In addition, hierarchies have a natural termination point. You get to the bottom of the hierarchy and you stop. So one hierarchy is the Windows folder system. Every folder can contain files and other folders. And those other folders can contain files and other folders and so on. So a really natural way if you need to process the folder hierarchy is to use recursion, process a folder and then call the same routine recursively for its contained folders. And we're going to look at an example of a routine that will go through and build a list of all the folders contained in a particular folder. So when we call this routine, we're going to pass in a cursor to hold the result, the name of the folder we want to start with, and whether we should in fact be starting over, whether this is the first call or a subsequent call basically. And in fact, the original version of this routine used an array and that L start over per parameter was really important this version with the cursor, it's less so. So what do we do in this routine? If the cursor doesn't already exist, we create it. It's got a single field M folder. If start over is true, we're gonna zap the cursor and keep track of how, the, in either case, keep track of how many there are there. Again, that's a carryover from the array version of this routine, which is included in the materials. We're gonna save where we started, what was the original folder? And then inside a try catch, we're gonna to change to the specified folder. If we're successful in changing to the specified folder, we use ADER and put it in, in into an array, put whatever folders, because we pass the D parameter that says folders only, 
put that into this array, and then we loop through the array, and we can start at position three because ADER will always give you dot and dot dot as the first two return values. <coughs> Excuse me. And for each element, we build what the name is. It's the folder we started in plus whatever name ADER returned. We insert that into the cursor for the result. And then we call this routine again recursively, passing the same cursor, the new folder that we just found, and we don't want to start over. And we do that for every folder. And then at the very end, we go back to the folder we were in when we came to this routine. And we just return how many there are. The ver what we're using here is called depth first search, meaning we're going to drill all the way to the bottom of the hierarchy and then come back up a little bit and back to the bottom and up a little bit and back to the bottom. And eventually we'll get done with the second lowest level and we'll come up. The other kind of thing we can do is called a breadth first search where we go all the way across a level and then all the way across the next level and so on. With recursion, depth first search is much easier. We'll see one example near the end of this session of breadth first search, but you have to do extra work to do breadth first search. All right, let's run this routine. And I wrote a little wrapper program. I'm going to put the result in cursor folders. I'm going to go into my D colon backslash Fox folder to start. That's where I put Fox Pro itself and all the tools that I use with VFP, every version of VFP that I have, although on this machine, I think it's just the one version because this isn't my production machine. I'm going to call drill down folders to cursor, passing in the cursor, the folder, and this is the first call, so I pass true. If I get a number greater than zero back, then to show you the result, I'm actually going to select into another cursor just because showing you a result that includes a memo field is ugly. So I'm just going to grab the first hundred characters of each folder name, throw that in a cursor and browse it. Again, this is demo where. So you can see it's running. It was showing us what it was doing. And here under D Fox, the first thing is essentials. That's where I have all the Henson workbooks that are on this machine. And again, this isn't my production machine. I don't have them all on here. But you can see, and you can see the depth first search. We go from essentials to essentials slash effective, which is Jim Booth and Steve Sawyer's book uh, about effective techniques. Go down to book, go down to application, go down to BMPs, and then across all the ones at that level, then back up to Sawyer and so forth. This is depth first. And I can just sort of jump through and you can see how we're going up and down and up and down. And there are 394 files, folders rather, not files, folders in this hierarchy. You can in fact use very similar code to get all the files that are in a given folder hierarchy. That's probably more useful. Um, code for that is included in the materials for this session. We're not gonna look at it here. It's a little more complicated and doesn't really show us anything that we didn't already see. Let's talk about object hierarchies, because that's the place where I use um, uh, recursion all the time. There are a number of tools in the VFP language that make it really easy to work with object hierarchies and that you'll see in a lot of this recursive code. The first is the objects collection. Every container object, every container class in VFP has an objects collection that contains a list of all of the objects that are in that collection. The for each loop is designed specifically for looping through co collections, and we'll use it a lot to go through, especially the objects collection. The PEM status function lets you ask questions about a given property event or method on a given object. What I will use it for the most here, not exclusively, but the most is to say, does this object have this property? And finally, the A members function populates an array with a list of the properties, events, and methods of a specified object. And all of those are really handy when you're writing recursive code. 
So let's start with event binding. I use event binding a lot in my base classes. They let me set things up to just happen. I, I think of them as set it and forget it. One of the things that I like to just happen is the ability to know on a given form, has any data changed on this form? Because then I could, for example, put an asterisk in the title bar when there's unsaved data. I can also, when somebody goes to close the form, ask them if they really want to close it without saving and only do that when there's unsaved data instead of every time, which is annoying. So I've added code to my base classes that let me do this. Each of my, each of the classes, the base classes for controls that actually are for data entry has a property L note change and a method any change. Those are custom. The L note change method says, do we want to notice changes about this control? And it lets us say this control matters. It actually holds data versus this control is for management of the form. Any change I have bound, I've, I've raised in, in the interactive change and programmatic change methods, I raise the any change event, the custom any change event, so that I have one place for each control that will fire if anything changes. So the code that you're seeing on the form, and I'll actually show it to you in for real, is in my base form class, This method is called bind control events. It receives a control, an object as a parameter, and it loops with for each through all the ob th through the object's collection of that control. The assumption is this is a collection. It should not get this routine should not get called if there is no object's collection. And we say if the control that we're looking at now, this member of the object's collection has the L note change property and it's true then we're gonna go ahead and bind that controls any change method to the any custom any change method of the form itself. So what I'm setting up is that any change to data anywhere on the form or any change to any control that we're choosing to notice anywhere on the form is gonna file fire the same form method. And then that form method, I can then do things like add the asterisk to the title bar or whatever it is I wanna do. Then once I do the binding, I say, if the control I'm looking at at this moment has an object's collection, call this routine recursively, bind control events, passing in that new control. So I'm drilling all the way to the bottom on the form. So maybe there's a page frame, from the page frame I go to the pages and then I go to the controls on the pages and maybe there's a container on one of the pages and I go to all the controls in that container and every control where L note change is true gets bound to the forms any change method. I have other event bindings that I do similarly in my base classes. There's one more discussed in the paper. Um, and if you look at the base classes are included in the material, so you'll see that there are other examples as well. Font sizes. A long time ago, I don't remember why, but I said it would be really interesting. Pro actually, it was probably when I was thinking about the question of making applications usable for people with disabilities. And I said, it'd be really neat if users could, on a given form, choose the font and font size that was used. And I worked out how we could let the user choose a font and size and then go ahead and change everything on the form to use that font and size. I haven't yet had any client who wanted that, but what I have done for a couple of clients is modified this code so that when the user changes the size of a form, we change the size of the controls or the fonts on that form that we, we resize proportionally so that when a form gets bigger, it gets, things get bigger. When the form gets smaller, words, letters get smaller. And that's really handy, especially as lots of people have much larger monitors running at much higher resolutions. And 
the application may have been designed for you know, eight by six or 12 by seven. And the user says, I want to make this form bigger and more readable. There's an article on my website describing the whole, that how this all works. We're going to look only at the parts of it that are recursive. And the first thing that we do recursively is we, actually, first we're going to demonstrate. I've got a sample form. I'm going to run it. Very simple form. Oh, I know. Hang on one second. Uh, we'll close that. I know what I did wrong. No, I didn't. Huh. I'm in the right folder. Okay. I don't know what that was. In any case, and if I grab this and drag it, you can see that the fonts get bigger. One of the things I have yet to do for a current customer is actually make sure that the user can only resize proportionally because funny things happen if you do, don't do it proportionally. Okay, so how does all that work? Oops. Oh, I see what happened. It overwrote the toolbox. Okay. So in this font sizer class, we have a save original method. The idea is that when the form opens, we need to save the original height, width, and font size of every object. And the way we do it is we actually save it to the object itself. So we don't need another control structure for that. So this routine receives an object as parameter. If the object has auto size on, it turns it off. And I'll say up front that this, my resizing does not work for objects that have auto size on. Then if the object has a height property, then add a property to the object itself called an original height and store its current height there. And then there's a little bit of special code for pages because they don't have their own height and width. And then we do the same thing for the width property. If the object has a width property, give it a new property and original width and store its width there. Same special handling for page. And then if the object has a font size property, create a new property and original font size and store its font size. So now this object that we're looking at has stored in new properties that we added to it, its original height, its original width, its original font size. Then comes the recursive part. If this object has an object's property, that is, it's a container, and if the object property, if the object, if that, op, if this object that we're looking at is not of the control base class, why the control base class? Well, this is a base class in VFP. It's like the container base class, except you can't see inside. So you can't do any of what I'm doing inside that control base class. So we're just omitting it here. I suspect I should be omitting it in some of the other examples you're going to see down the, the road in this session. But since I never use the control base class, it hasn't come up. It did come up in this case. Anyway, if it has an objects collection, loop through the objects collection with for each and call this routine for each contained object that we find. So we're going to drill all the way down on the form and on every object store its height, width, and font size. Okay. And how does this happen? Well, in the init method of the of this cus font size object, you put this cus font size control onto a form that you want to allow to have resizing. And it, it gets instantiated in the init of the form, and it's the form itself is passed to the init of the cus font size object. We start things off by calling save original, passing in whatever the container is, the form. And then we bind the container, the form's resize to the catch resize method of this class, the, the resizing class. In catch resize, we figure out who called us and we compute a new size. I'm not gonna get into how all that works. 
that is the generic font size for the form. We have special handling for things on the form that are a different size. And we call the recursive change font size method, method passing in the object that triggered this catch resize. And change font size, we're gonna do something we haven't done before. We're gonna do the recursion first rather than last. So one of the things in my control base classes is a custom L change font on resize property. So if the control has that property and if it's true, because we might choose some things not to be resized, then if the object we're currently looking at has an object's collection, drill down, loop through the object's collection and call this method recursively. We're doing this first here because as we change the font sizes of things, while their size shouldn't change, there might be implications at a higher level. And so we wanna do the, small, the things at the very bottom first and work our way back up. Then after we've drilled all the way down, we come back to this one. If it has a font size property and it has an original height property, the custom one that we added and save original, then we say, well, was the original font size the same as the form level original font size? If so, just use the font size we already calculated. Otherwise, calculate a custom font size for this object that's using a different font size than, the than most of the form. And then we do a little bit of checking to make sure that the text that's already in the control fits. I'm not going to get into that. And then finally, we set its font size to the newly computed font size. So we drill all the way down and then working our way back up, we change the font size. And as you saw, it works pretty well. It's not perfect, but it's quite good, good enough for production. Huh. Okay, many years ago, a really long time ago, I took over an application that had been written by an amateur, somebody who knew computer science but didn't really have experience writing um, production applications. And among the problems with this application, there were many, but among them is that most of the controls in most of the forms had not been renamed. They all had their default names. And the forms used lots of page frames, even page frames on page frames. And so on a given form, there might be three or four different controls named text three. And when I went into code to try to make changes to the code, figuring out what control it was talking about was really brutal. And I asked around and I said, anybody got a tool to let me do this easily? And nobody had done anything. So I wrote one and you see it here on the form. Um, when I first shared it with a few friends, Rick Schumer said, hey, that should be a builder. So we made a few changes to make it work as a builder. And it's now available and it is in Thor, you can get it. There's also a paper on my web website that talks about how, how it works and how it's written. And it allows us to take a form like the sample I showed you before, where you may have noticed and wondered, why didn't Tamar rename those controls? Well, because I wanted to do this demo. So for example, on page one of this page frame, we have edit base one. And on page two of this page frame, we also have edit base one. And we have some code in this form, not a whole lot because this is just a really simple demo form. But here in the refresh method of the form, I'm changing the value of one of these edit boxes. And on this form, it's not that hard to know what it is, but on a complicated form with a lot going on, that'd be a pain to have. So I can use this builder And it opens up and it has this list of all of the controls on the form. And when you click in the list, it highlights the one you're looking at. And sometimes when you're inside a page frame, things get funky. There we go. And you can type in a new name. I'm just gonna do the two edit boxes here for convenience. This one is edit address. Let's find the one on page two. When I was using this with the application I built it for, I actually would go all the way through and rename everything. So edit notes and I hit rename and you can see that got renamed. And 
that got renamed. And most importantly, the code got changed to the right one. And if I had renamed all those other things, they'd have been changed too. So how did I do this? I'm not gonna save those changes. I might wanna do this demo again. This is the main um, class for the control renamer, not the UI, but the class itself, which I wrote in a PRG. Um, and there's actually two ways that I'm using uh, recursion. We're only gonna look at one of them now because they're very similar. The grab controls method is called early on to build a cursor of all the controls that are on the form where we want to do renaming. An object is passed, or I'm sorry, the, the class itself has an O object parameter, which is the object it was called, the form, presumably, that it was called to rename. It actually works with other kinds of containers, but we'll talk about a form. And it add, it calls a method that gets some information about that object and then inserts information about that object into a cursor called all controls. Then we call drill controls. That's our recursive method. We pass the form, the object that we've been asked to rename things on, and we pass the name of the form. We're going to need the name of each object, the complete name from the name of the form down through all the containership levels in order to do the, the to do the code modifications. Let's go take a look at what drill controls does. Drill controls receives two parameters, a container and the hierarchy that gets you to that container. And what does it do? It calls a members and gets a list of all of the controls that are inside that container. When you pass two as the third parameter A members, you only get contained controls using the actual containership hierarchy that's built into the form. Then we loop through the array that A members creates. And for each item that we find, each control, we get an object reference by using the O container dot and then the name of the control evaluate that gives us the object reference. We call that get info method to get information about uh, this new object. We do a little bit of work that I'm not gonna drill into to figure out, are we actually able to rename this particular object? There are various reasons why we can't. And then we add a record to all controls about this object. And then just as we've seen in a bunch of our other, sorry, too, 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 too hot with the mouse. Uh, as we've seen with a bunch of our other hierarchy examples, we check, does this object have an object's collection? And if it does, we call this routine recursively, passing the object that we just looked at and the name, the hierarchy to that object, which is the hierarchy we came in with, plus a dot, plus the name of this object. So um, my form dot page frame one, dot page frame, dot page two, dot edit base one, or whatever it is. In this tool, there is a second recursion that we're not going to look at where we go through all the code and find all the places where controls are referenced. That code is actually a little more complicated. Um, and as I say, it's all available on my website. Okay. Um, and this is a good place to take questions. Uh, there's just one question. It goes back to the font resizer. Sure. Um, uh, Bill asks, wouldn't set all work here? No. Um, there, set all would work if everything is using the same font size in the first place. But it's pretty common on forms not to be. Um, and um, the truth is also, it's long enough since I wrote that, that I don't remember all the details. I'm sure my article addresses that. Okay, that, that's it for questions. Oh, okay. So continuing on, I mentioned at the top that recursion could be a single routine, 
but it also could be multiple routines communicating with each other, that one routine calls the other, which calls the first and so on. And I have one example of that, and it's fairly complex to the point that we're not gonna look in at the actual code. We're gonna look at code on the slide when we get there, though we'll look at the tool itself. So not as many years ago as when I wrote the control renamer, I was working on a project that had a really complex object hierarchy. Um, some of you have heard me talk about this project before where we were holding a representation of something in the real world in an object hierarchy with a lot of collections and a lot of cross references and it was pretty complicated. And the VFP debugger just was not doing the job. I simply couldn't, it, it was so much effort debugging with the, the debugger because the debugger does not drill into collections. And I asked around and said, anybody got an object inspector, a collection inspector? And there were a couple of tools and I played with them and they just didn't give me what I wanted. So stop me if you've heard this before, I wrote my own. Um, and this tool was based on the Explorer classes that Doug published for all of us, created and published, and they're amazing. Let me show you this first. So um, to demonstrate this, I'm gonna run a little bit of code that just creates a collection that a multi-level object hierarchy. And I wanna say this as loudly as I can. I'm using a public variable here solely because this is a demo. I wanna run this code and I want this hierarchy, this collection to exist after the code runs. I do not use public variables in production code. So now that I've said that, um, all this is gonna do is create a collection and add a bunch of things to the collection. And this collection is a bunch of countries and within each country, their languages and their political divisions, states, provinces, cantons, that sort of thing. So I've run it and I now, if I were to type into the command window, so countries, you'd see that yes, this exists and there's some stuff for it. But I'd like to see what it looks like. And that's complicated. I wanna see what's in there. And the debugger is not gonna do that for me. But the tool that I wrote, the object and collection inspector, which is available through Thor, will let me do that. And this is sort of interesting because it doesn't run it by itself because in order to run this, you need to pass in the top level object you're interested in, this O countries collection that I just created. So Thor just puts in the command window, the command to run the thing. And here it is, and you saw this on the slide. So I've got this collection. It has three items, it has some properties. Its name is call countries. It has a member item one, the United States of America, which has a bunch of properties. And I can drill down into this and it has one, a, a, a collection of languages with a single item. And that single item is just a scalar value. It's not, a, it's not an object, it's just a value, English. And it's got this other collection of states and provinces. And I was really lazy and only put the first two, Alabama and Alaska. And inside those, they have counties. And again, I was lazy and only added the first two. And it has this, the state object has an object reference back to the country. But the, this is gonna turn out to be an important point as we look at this, that I don't show it here. I say, we've already done this. So click here if you wanna go there and it takes you back. And similarly, we've got province, states and provinces, provinces for Canada and so on. So this is the tool um, and I created it and I shared it with a few people and a number of people made suggestions and I have to call out um, the late Matt Slay who made had several great suggestions for making this tool better and some of which got implemented. So he, as he did with so much, this is a tool that Matt made better for the community even though he didn't write the code. So how does this all work? 
we're as I said, we're going to look at this on slides because the code is really complicated. So Doug created this set of Explorer classes. In fact, let me go back and let us look at this first. And these Explorer classes in all have this structure of the um, tree view on the left and then different panes on the right, depending what you're looking at in the tree view. And the Explorer has a method, the Explorer class has a method called fill tree view cursor. The tree view is run from a cursor and there's a fill tree view cursor method. And that's where I kick off recursion here. This is just a little bit of what is in that method. We check the root object of the Explorer. That is whatever we passed in, O countries in the example that I showed you. If it has a base class and that base class is collection, then we add to the tree view cursor a bunch of stuff about that collection. We mark that we visited that root node and I'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. And then I call a method, add collection members to tree view cursor. And we're gonna look at some of the code from that method, but it does what it says. It says, I've got a collection. Every member of the collection needs to go in the tree view. So we're gonna loop through them and add them. At this point, if in the else case, we know that if the root isn't a collection, it's an object because we checked that on the way in. It has to be, it has to be an object, not a scalar. So we add some information to the cursor for the tree view based on it being an object, not a collection. We note that we visited it. And then we call find object properties for tree view cursor. And that method's job is to take any object and go through all its properties and find out if any of those are objects or collections. Okay, so a um, couple of things to note here. As we saw in the example, we have the possibility of circular references here. The state object had a back reference to the country. So we need a way to make sure that when we get to that reference to the country that we don't say, oh, here's another thing we need to drill down to because we've already done it. And so this O oh, items visited collection is the way we're handling that. And anytime we go ahead and do the work for an object, we add it to that collection with add item visited. The other thing is it turned out when we did this, and in fact, let me go back and run the thing again, that we really wanted, oh, I must have cleared things. No, it's okay. That we really wanted this to be breadth first. Up till now, everything we've looked at, we've done depth first. We drilled all the way down and back up. But because we have these circular references like this one, we wanted to make sure that we put the information for the country the first time we saw it, not down here on some link four levels down. And that meant we needed to do a breadth first search through the collection. We want to, with call countries, we want to go through all the countries first. And then for each country, we want to go through all their languages and then through all their states and provinces. And then for each state or province, then we'll go through all their counties. So there's some extra code here that lets us do that. You can't see it here, but you will see it on the next couple. Well, not even here, but you'll see it on the third version. This is in the add collection members to tree view cursor method. There's a whole lot of code in that method, but the important code for recursion is that after we've done a whole lot of work to figure out what is this item in the collection? Is it another collection? Is it a, an object that's not a collection? Is it a scalar? Is it a backward reference? If it turns out it's a collection, we call the same method recursively. If it turns out it's some other kind of an object, not a collection, then we're going to call find object properties for tree view cursor, the other method that does the other part of the work. So what happens in add collection members to tree view cursor is there's a for each loop through all those members. 
that collect up information for each member. And then at the end, after we've stored that information, does this for each member and triggers off the recursion. The other method, find object properties for tree view cursor, uses a members to get a list of all the objects, all the members, sorry, all the properties of the current object and loops through them. And in doing the loop through them, figures out, is this a collection? Is this an object other than a collection? Is this just a value? Or is this an object, but we've seen it before? And it populates an array, a object info for, for each item that needs further exploration, each collection or object property, it populates an array with the name of the method we need to call, what that object is that we're calling it on, and the CID is the unique ID we assign each object to help us track which ones we've seen. So these two blocks of three lines for the array happen inside the main loop of this routine. After that main loop, after we've added everything to the tree view cursor, all the properties of this object, then we run another loop through this A object info array, and we pull out for each element what method we're supposed to call on what object and what its ID is. And we build the appropriate call to either add collection members to tree view cursor or find object properties for tree view cursor. And then we run that command. So again, we're looping through the whole object and hanging on to information so that later on we can do the recursive call. So we get the breadth first search. We also make sure that we don't drill down more than we should. We'll talk about that again in a minute. Okay. So that's the object inspector. That's calls cooperating recursive routines. So let's talk about how we can get recursion wrong. I really talked about this a little bit right at the top, but let's drill in a little more now. The first things are there has to be a termination condition. If there's no termination condition, you're going to explode the program stack and your code isn't going to work. If there is a termination condition, but you never get there, same problem. Sometimes the termination is obvious in the Fibonacci and factorials. We knew what they were factorial zero factorial is one for Fibonacci. The first two items are one. Sometimes it's about structure. When we went through the file hierarchy or all those object hierarchies, we got to the bottom. There weren't any more underneath. So with the file, with the folders, ADER didn't return any new folders. So there was nothing to do. Sometimes you have to do something special. That's what I was talking about with the object inspector. So we have this code as we explore, um, and I actually don't remember which routine it comes from, but this code in the object inspector says, if this is a class, if it's, if it's an object, go look it up in our items visited. And if we get a value back, then, ah, we've seen this before. So classify this as previous, put it on page four of the page frame, but classify it as previous. That's the most important part. So we're not going to drill down from this one because we already saw it. And as we go through object properties and collection members, if none of them reference other objects or collections, then again, there'll be no recursive calls. So eventually we get to the bottom. As I said, you have to get to the termination condition. You'll remember that the factorial and Fibonacci routines checked for bad input initially. If we called factorial with minus three, then we'd call it recursively with minus four and minus five, and we'd never end, we'd blow up. So you have to make sure that you're gonna to get to the termination. Let's talk about the thing that I really deferred at the beginning, variables. The concern 
is that if you don't declare variables in VFP, they may be shared among multiple calls in the stack. In VFP, if you declare a variable in a routine, if you declare it local, it's visible only in that routine. If you declare it private, it's visible in that routine and in any routine that one calls unless that one declares the same variable. And a public variable, once you declare it, is visible everywhere unless you declare it otherwise. The key thing is if you do not declare a variable, but you use it, it's private. And that means it's visible in any routine that is called by the routine that you're in. And so if you're not careful to make sure you declare variables, I prefer to make it local, but they could even be private. But if you're not careful to declare variables in a recursive routine, you can end up breaking your code. And let's go ahead and look at an example. In VFP, we're really lucky. We have built-in routines that do um, sorting and searching in arrays. But when I first started using Fox Base, back in the late 80s, there weren't any. And if you wanted to sort or search in an array, you had to write your own code. I came out of a computer science background. That wasn't a problem for me. And in fact, the very first article I ever wrote about Fox was about sorting and searching in arrays. Now we have the A sort and A scan routines. But imagine that we didn't. There's a really nice sorting algorithm that is recursive. It's called merge sort. And the way it works is that you give it a list and it splits the lists in half, left and right, you can think of it. And it sorts each half and then it merges the two together because they're now sorted. You can go through them in parallel and, and build the result. But of course, the way the left and right half get sorted is you break each of them in half and sort each of those. So, I've written a merge sort routine. As I say, you don't actually need this in VFP because you can just use a sort, but pretend we don't have a sort. So we pass in an array. We find out how long is this array, how many elements. And if there's more than one element, we find the middle, divide it in two, and it doesn't have to be the exact middle. We dimension an array. The, oh, I want to just point out that up here at the top, I declared as local the two arrays A left and A right. So now we redimension A left to be half the elements, half plus or minus one. And then we copy from the array from position one up to the middle into the left array, and we call merge sort on the left array. Then we do the other end, the right end. So we redimension the right end to whatever, however many more there are copy from the original array starting at middle plus one up to the end, and we merge sort that one. When we get back, we have two sorted arrays that are each about half the length of the original. So now we just do the merge. We start at position one in all three arrays, left, right, and the original array. And while we haven't reached the end of either left or right, that's what the do while says, if the next element on the left is less than or equal to the next element on the right, copy the next element on the left into the main array at the current position and increment the left array. Otherwise, if the one on the right is larger than the one on the left, copy from the right array into the main array and increment the right one. Either way, increment the main one. When we come out of this do while loop, we will have used all of the elements in one of the two arrays, but there'll be stuff left in the other one. So we figure out which one it is, and we loop through whichever one is left, copying the rest of the items into the original array. And that's all. That's the routine. So let's go ahead and run that. And my demo where code to run that, way down here, is um, this. And to be able to show you something, it's a little bit strange. So I'm going to choose a thousand items out of the first 10,000 integers. So I declare an array of a thousand items and I use Rand to put 
a thousand random items between one and 10,000 into the array. Now I wanna show you what's in that array and showing you an array is a pain. So I simply dump it into a cursor and browse it. Then I'm gonna call merge sort on the original array. And when we're done, I'm gonna use the same technique again. I'm gonna dump the array into a cursor and browse that cursor. So when I run this, you're gonna see one cursor that's the original array. And then after that one cursor, that's the sorted array. So the original array here, you can see those are certainly not ordered. And very quickly, here they are in order. Okay. But I can break that really easily if I don't declare those arrays originally. Here, I forgot, or I said, well, I'm gonna dimension them later. So it doesn't matter for me to have a local declaration. So what happens is, yeah, we create the array here on the dimension statement, but we create it as private. And because there's no actual declaration in this routine, when we're running the code, we don't get a new instance of a left when we call recursively, we just redimension the one we have. This code is identical to the code I showed you before. Actually, I didn't even, it actually calls the original merge sort. Let me fix that, that's a mistake. I made some changes very late in the game and missed that. So we're gonna call this routine merge sort bug recursively. And I have, an almost identical routine to the test routine. The only difference from the test routine we saw a minute ago is this time we call merge sort bug, not merge sort. So again, here is a, an unsorted list. Of course, it's different because they're random, but we never get there. The subscript is outside defined range. Why? Because we drilled down and we resized a left and a right. We didn't create a new one in the recursive call. We reused the same one. But when we came back, then we had the smaller one that we had created. And we can actually see that. In the instance that we're in, the original array, in this call, A array has four elements, but A left has only one, and A right has two, but A left has one. So we've broken things. So I hope this makes the point that you must be sure to declare, if you want a variable in a recursive routine, by default, assume you must declare it. Now, that said, there are situations where it can be really handy to make something private in the calling routine and then have it available through all the calls. On the slide about the Fibonacci uh, code, I had that chart of how many calls it took. The way I did that, was I created a set special version of Fibonacci. Actually, let me show you the calling code first. I created a special version of the calling code that declared a private variable, LN calls, because I wanted that variable to exist before the first recursive call. And then in the special version that I created to count, I added this, if LN calls exists, increment it. So the first thing I do every time this routine is called is increment that private variable created by the caller. And that way I was able to count how many calls there were without having to pass a parameter through for it. If it were something we needed in the routine, a parameter would be better, but instrumenting like this, do, doing something which isn't part of the process, I kind of like, doing it this way. And by having the type here, I'm making sure I don't break anything. Okay. So let's summarize and then I'll take some more questions.
recursion is easy. A lot of people are scared of it and say it's very hard. But as long as you remember to include a termination condition and a way to get there and to declare things, recursion is easy. It's really great for anything hierarchical. And those are really my takeaways. So at this point, I'll take further questions. Uh, there's just one, and it was uh, it was answered by a couple people, but I want to see if you have a different take. So Tom asks, how to call the object inspector with a form because you can't use this form? Do you put a call in uh, a call to it in a button? Uh, Joel responded, that's what I did when I used it. And Richard said, uh, modify form and then invoke the inspector. So, but I want you to have a chance to see if you would do it okay, a different well, way than that. Yeah, so what I've done is that in fact, you're right, you wouldn't, I, I, I guess I guess you could have you could have a debugging button on your form that that's only available in developer mode as um, Joel suggested. But what I like to do, I tend to use it when I'm already debugging. And so typically there is some kind of an object reference to the form available at that point, th whether through underscore screen or if the if there's a an application object geoapp dot forms of whatever. So that's typically how I get my hands on a form that I want to use with the object inspector. Okay. Uh, Charles asks, beyond tools, can you tell us about other uses for recursion that you've seen or worked on? Well, we, I did show um, early in the session, the stuff that's in my base classes. In addition to the example that I showed of being able to track whether things have been changed on a form. I also, and this one's in the paper, use recursion in my base classes to set up event binding so that I can treat everything inside a container as if it were a single object in various ways. That came out of an application where I was creating containers full of things that were visual. And so I might have a container and three or four shapes and some labels in it but they all really represented one real world object. And I might want to be able to drag and drop that. And so I really didn't want to have, um, I, I, I didn't want to have each object treated separately for the purposes of drag and drop or clicking or whatever. Um, another example that's in the paper and the materials, but I didn't show here is the Windows registry. That's another hierarchical um, uh, situation. The, the, each, the registry contains these top level things. And the, each within the registry, you have keys and each key contains values and other keys. And you might want to drill down through those. And the registry class that's in the Fox Pro Foundation classes is great for getting stuff out and if you, if you don't want just at one level, but you want to drill through stuff, recursion is really handy there. I, I, as a comment, I've actually used recursion um, in multiple places, but one was your file folder example where you showed processing files in subdirectories. That, that's, a, that's a fairly common use. Another one is from your presentation last year with GraphViz. I've actually implemented it. And um, I wanted to be able to visually show relationships between tables. And that requires recursion because table A is related to B and B is related to C and C is related to D and so on. And some, and people, and I won't read them out, but people have commented in the chat window some other examples that they've given as well. Uh, that's it for questions. Okay. Well, thank you all very much. Please remember to fill out your evaluations. And if anybody has questions they didn't want to put in the chat, I'll be over in the session room in a few minutes to take any further questions. Thanks so much.